So I'm Eric Robichaud with Green Goddess Supply. Um, today, as Steve said, we're going to do our uh, Home Grow 102 webinar. Uh, the first one was pretty well received. People liked it. Uh, it's free, uh, good information. We usually like to try to bring in some guests, make it interesting and uh, more educational. So today with me, uh, we have uh, Vincent Batetti from Green Goddess Supply as well. Uh, and uh, the inventor of the Armoire Home Grow Systems. I have a couple of them behind me here. And, um, and heads up uh, quite a few things at our, at our uh, organization, including the uh, Concierge Specialist team. Uh, we also have uh, Tommy Fox from Fishhead Farms, um, makers of Fish Shit, which we um, not only just recommend highly, but we have, actually have it built into our, our own grow protocol. Um, and we have Aaron from uh, 2020 Mendocino, uh, really high quality uh, breeders uh, of um, uh, cannabis seeds. And we have a bunch of those. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We have a bunch of those uh, up in the, uh, the Auto Flower Store uh, website. Um, we'll come back and circle on that. Um, Vincent, do you want to um, talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing here today, the uh, Auto Flower Focus and so forth? Yeah, we um, we decided early on to focus on auto flowers, um, mainly because it, you all know how it works with the states. It's kind of a patchwork of of um, cities, counties, and states, and it's all about tax revenue for these people, right? I live in California. I think we're up to about 50 percent now access. Uh, you would think access is everywhere. And it is if you count the cartels and you count the, the humble guys that don't want to go legal and you count the guys that aren't legal and you count all the home grows that aren't legal. And uh, I mean, huge home grows uh, that aren't legal. Um, uh, and um, we cater to the personal user, somebody who every 60, 70 days can go with a quarter pound and be satisfied. Although we do have quite a few customers that have bought one or two or three units, actually. And these people are 95% are beginners. And since they're beginners, auto flowers is really the way to go for them. Um, uh, the learning curve, even for auto flowers, for a beginner is, is really, really uh, <laughs> difficult. And, and they're very spoiled, actually. Um, what do you mean? I got 10 more days to go and you're like on day 60, you know, and you just told them, well, it's going to be 10 more days. She's just not ready. Well, what do you mean? The, the package says 60 days. And so we deal with a lot of that. And, and these people have no idea of, you know, growing outside for seven months or something, you know, and dealing with the bugs and, and, and everything else. Um, so it, it's, it's been a, a very interesting journey, um, but I'm glad we focused on auto flowers. They, they've also kind of become all the rage. And I did a, I did a, um, I was a speaker and that's where I met you, Tommy. I was a speaker at uh, Harvest Cup. At the Harvest Cup. I, well, I recognize the badge. <laughs> Harvest Cup. And um, I was on right after Ed Rosenthal. And my whole thing was just basically, I kind of condensed it down to auto flowers are just another hybrid. Okay, instead of trying to make them out to be something totally different, they're just another hybrid. I mean, you got indicas, you got sativas from different continents, and 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 technically the cannabis root lars is from different continent. And if you were to read all of the state laws, boy, they 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 don't leave root laris out. It's like here's what's illegal. Indica, Sativa, and Rutilaris, because back in the 70s, Rutilaris was the only thing they could buy in Canada, because the only thing that would grow in cold climates. And back then, it was like 7% THC. Um, of course, today, you know, you can get, I don't know, all the way up to 30% THC. I don't know if there's any higher, anything higher than that. Um, Aaron, maybe you would know. Um, but... Um, people are really happy when they have good genetics, when they have cheap, and I tell people, beware of uh, free seeds and funny names. Um, so basically, we're kind of trying to make today a little, a little about 
the soils that are out there, the living soils, whether it be the lower end ones or, or the higher end ones. Um, and um, also the genetics, you know, the genetics have come a long way and that has taken a good 30 years. Um, and, and, and the same thing literally happened with indicas and sativas. I mean, we mucked it up for a very long time by interbreeding the two. And pretty soon we had a bunch of mothers, brothers, sisters, cousins, it's this incestuous thing. And I don't know, again, Aaron, maybe you can answer this. Can you find 100% pure sativa anywhere today? Commercially, like buy sativa? No. Right. No, I mean, short answer, no. Uh, if, I know it gets a little, it gets detailed, but but the short answer. Short answer, no. Yeah, no, most things are polyhybrids these days. Um, and most people don't, this is a little bit personal opinion of mine, but uh, it's, it's an opinion that comes from growing. Most people don't actually want a sativa. Um, only a handful of people have the headspace to grow a sativa and the patience to grow a sativa. Um, they just, they don't have the space or the patience to do it, really. Um, most people want a quick product on their turnaround. You were joking earlier about autos that take longer than 70 days. And it's like, well, you know, sure. Um, it's going to take you longer than 12 weeks to flower most sativas, most real sativas, especially the ones that if you're saying, hey, is there a true 100% sativa out there? I mean, probably, but it's bred for tropic conditions, you know? Yeah, I, um, used to, I used to grow in the 70s. I'm 67 years old, so I've been growing a very long time. And I was a biology major. And so botany kind of got me going. And um, I started planting the seeds in the bags from Mexico, which came from Panama or Mexico or or. or, or wherever they came from, right? Um, and it was interesting because I only had a, a five foot wall around my house. And so the sativas would get to like one inch from the top of the wall and I'd have to bend them, right? And then mm -hmm. my backyard was a, was a complete um, <laughs> zigzag, like for 30 feet, 20 feet, whatever it was, 15 to 20 feet, you know, just zigzag five feet, five feet, five feet, five feet, five feet, big knuckles at, at, at each juncture, you know, and it was looked like a prehistoric forest out there, you know, and then they started spraying malathion somewhere in the late 70s in California, which was to kill off the fruit flies coming in from Mexico and the fruit or whatever, and um, that's when I moved indoors with halide lights. And that's when I learned all about spider mites and other bugs that uh, like hot places like garages and stuff. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, those were the last sativas I really had my hands on. Um, and you're right. I, I, I think that, I mean, our box is, is only five feet tall. So, you know, you have to train these autos, even in our box, some, some of them will out like a Northern Lights, which will go 90 days, 100 days, will easily outgrow our box if you do not train it, you keep training it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it can get kind of weird, but, but definitely, um, yeah, I, no, nobody wants to grow 15, 15 foot tall sativas in a warehouse and there's really no reason. Let's, uh, hey, why don't we uh, talk, talk, we're talking genetics, we're talking sativas, why don't we um, talk a little bit um, about that. Um, Aaron, um, you're from 2020 Mendocino, why don't you tell us, uh, give us a little introduction to yourself, background, tell us about 2020, uh, what you guys are doing out there, and then uh, we'll go from there with some, uh, some questions. Cool. Hi, I'm Aaron, I'm from 2020. Uh, we're a small breeding company, uh, small in that there's only a handful of people that are actually pulling the strings out here. So we all end up wearing multiple hats. Uh, I spend most of my time on the auto flowers. So I have some pretty good insight into that arm of the company, but we also breed photo periods. Uh, we grow a lot indoors and outdoors. Uh, we have some pretty interesting test gardens 
we have a north facing garden that we like to test uh, stubborn genetics in. And that's on a hill with tree covers. So it only ends up getting like, even during the summer, like during June right now, it only ends up getting three or four like direct sunlight hours. So it's interesting. We get to, we get to put some unique stress on some plants and see what they can handle uh, for an entire outdoor season. Uh, that's just one of our gardens. It's just one that it's, it's a selling point. I like to, to say is like, you know, this is, we grow indoor, we grow outdoor, we, you know, and, and when I say everybody grows mids, I'm like, we grow mids sometimes, you know, it's like everybody does. Uh, so yeah, we, we grow a lot of weed. We find out what grows best. And then the other thing is uh, like as breeders, you know, just understand that we're growing weeds so that you can grow weed. Uh, so, you know, you'll, you'll see, and we do it too. Everybody needs to be good at marketing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of like really, really interesting crosses out there these days. Uh, but we're, we're growing weed. Like the purpose, every time we grow a plant, the purpose for that plant is to carry seeds so that other people can grow weed. Like that's the sole purpose. Um, so, yeah. Right. So now we have um, quite, you know, a few of your uh, autos in the autoflowerstore.com uh, website that we run. Um, and um, y- you guys have a great reputation. I know a lot of growers that have been using your products and, and rave. Um, so like this is a, um, a freebie sampler that, that we're sending out to people. So, uh, this one's nose candy. And I don't know if you'll see it on the video, but down here, all of your products are very clearly labeled. That's an F3. They're all very clearly labeled. And, um, and you have a beautiful um, magazine, a beautiful book, that uh, whole catalog with gorgeous photos. You guys have done a phenomenal job on that. Um, and uh, beautiful photos, lots of details on every strain. Um, and they're all labeled, which is really, really cool. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about that for folks, uh, talk about the, um, that labeling F3, F4, what that means. And, um, and then your personal as, as a company for 2020, um, you know, sort of your personal rules for, for that. Cause obviously I know you're not sending out F1s. So why don't you, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, so that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, with autos. Well, okay, so first you brought up nose candy, yes. which is the seeds that we that you have are an F3. Now, nose candy was made, so F, a filial generation, I could be pronouncing that wrong, filial generation, filial generation, uh, that's your F1, F2, F3, F4, etc. Uh, with autos, this gets really interesting because there are a lot of people in the auto realm that are trying to do something like a sour diesel auto which is kind of like jumbo shrimp. It's an oxymoron, right? Um, but there are people who do it nonetheless, and they, they make mistakes along the way. The odds of those mistakes being prevalent in your grow early in the breeding process are higher than later. So if you get like an F1 of a true sour diesel crossed to a true ruderalis, you're going to get a whole bunch of seeds that are not even autoflowers. And then the next generation, those seeds are going to have to segregate. So you'll have seeds with all sorts of varying traits. And then the next generation, you'll have another batch of seeds that still have varying traits. And so if you haven't been bottlenecking your genetics for several, um, if you haven't been selectively gardening for each of those generations, by the time you're ready to make seeds, you could still have a pretty random batch of seeds. Um, So we, we take a, a very gardening style approach. Like if you're a home gardener or, or if you grow fruit or if you uh, do like seeds, like heirloom tomatoes and stuff, we take that style of uh, gardening approach to how we make seeds. Now with the, to address it one step further when it comes to filial generations on our genetics, we have been working really hard recently to turn our photo period strains into auto flowering strains. And so in this way, we're not constantly relying on last year's hot brand with the word auto after it for its name. Uh, Cause a lot of these times it's just, uh, 
for a lot of the times that's that's just a sales point like i I don't want to see gelato auto even though i have a biscotto and it's very good i don't want to see this this line of like uh runts auto gelato auto lemon auto it's like that's kind of boring for one so we're able to take our photos which already have very interesting flavors and very interesting characteristics and we're able to selectively breed those into ruderalis over the course of what would be uh you know for some for some breeders it could take you know three or four years uh but because of the the number of grows that we have going the number of generations that we can test each plant we can typically get this process done in like two years give or take and then so that's 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 photo period to auto flower conversion and so you'll see a, a lot of that. That's a, more of a commercial demand. This, this are the people who want like really hot strains, but they want them in an auto flower. You mentioned Northern Lights earlier. Like imagine somebody who doesn't know anything about weed, but they just want purple haze and you sell the armoire and the seeds. So what are you gonna sell to that customer? Like you can't just make purple haze out of nothing, but you can select the traits that were desirable from purple haze. You can try to put those into a ruderalis. You can call that ruderalis purple haze auto. Um, so again, that's photo period to auto flower conversion. You, you brought up the nose candy earlier. And so this is where I tie a little bow on this very long winded answer of mine is the nose candy, uh, is a really interesting project. It's an auto flower cross with an auto flower and then that crossed onto itself. So the nose candy parents are Trizzlers and uh, Muchacha, which at the time was a glue sniffer auto flower conversion project. So the Trizzlers was an auto flowering project that we had going on from the beginning with its origins, uh, basically in a triangle Kush auto. That's what we used to start for the Trizzlers. Um, and a watermelon Skittles auto. But again, that's that's how we started with the Trizzlers, was breeding those two together. And then the glue sniffer was a photo period to auto flower conversion project. And we had done that uh, to make muchacha. And that had been maybe three or four generations, probably an F4 by the time we made the nose candy. And so for the nose candy, we had a stable glue sniffer, which or muchacha, I'm sorry. It was a, a glue sniffer. Glue sniffer is our photo period, and it is exceptionally good weed, but we converted it into an auto flower. And so I, I still get the names a little bit mixed up, but when I'm talking about the auto flower, I'm referring to muchacha in the magazine. Um, so we took the muchacha F4. So it was the auto flower converted into the, or the photo period converted into the auto flower, and then taken four generations farther in that genetic pool and that was the muchacha and then we took the trizzlers which was the triangle kush auto and the watermelon skittles auto and that had reached i believe an f3 maybe an f4 by the time we were ready to use that as a parent and so that was the parent of the nose candy so those were two autos that were both at f4 stability that were used to make seeds with each other um those parents are really wildly different parents so the muchacha autoflower uh tends to go a little bit closer to 90 days than most other autos and there are a lot of people that they know fast flowering autos so they get nervous i promise you they're still auto flowering seeds um and that trait comes through in a couple of the, of the nose candies so if you're getting a two pack of nose candies and you get one that's really fast and one that's really slow, the odds of that happening aren't 50, 50 all the time. It's probably more like, like 80% fast, 20% slow, but because you have only gotten the two seeds, you got the luck of the draw there. There are a couple of, uh, very slow, very land race style, uh, seeds that you'll find in the nose candy. Um, but this general trend of stability increasing 
as you get to that F4, F5 range, is something you're going to see from a lot of auto flower breeders, whether they're converting photo periods into auto flowers or whether they're making hot auto flowers from whatever they have going on right now. Can I ask you a question about that? Um, Please. Do, do you, when do you call it like the IBL? Right, you call it a five or do you call it a nine? Where do you say it's stable? It's, it's funny because it's not, uh, again, because we take the, like the gardening approach to this, it's more whatever generation comes out the most smokable. Um, See, customers, I, I, ask me, customers ask me all the time, what's the difference between an F3 and F6 and an F9, for instance? Um, yeah, I, so those, that's going to be two questions. So I, uh, the first question is, is um, at what generation do I know the stability? And the answer is going to be more from the gardening perspective. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose the fruit that's ripe. So sometimes the F4 really is the best smoke. Sometimes the F5 really is the best smoke. Um, and sometimes the F9 is not the best smoke. Sometimes you smoke the F9 and you're like, dang, the, F, the F7 was better. And it's a good thing we make tons of seeds for all those times. Um, and then what's the difference between uh, your fifth generation and your ninth generation? Uh, that you could kind of think of it from any other breeding perspective. You know, it's... Uh, like what's the gender, what's, what are differences between like, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same because plants are a little bit different than people or than dogs, but you know, what's the difference between like a dog and his great, great grandfather, you know, like it's and not generally, always going to be the best. Yeah. It, the genes aren't always going to be the best because they're newest. Uh, sometimes there's, sometimes there's good stuff to be found in that F4, F5 range. Because uh, I, I use the dog analogy mm -hmm. from time to time because uh, a lot of new growers, you know, and our customers, 99%, I don't know, Eric, 95 to 99, they're new. They've never grown a plant. You know, it became legal in Virginia and we had an onslaught, you know, of orders. It was incredible. Um, but they never, no one had ever grown before. And um we recommend certain seeds, which is why we're trying to curate a seed bank. Um, you know, we don't want to be a seed bank at the moment, but we want to curate good seeds. Um, and they ask me, how come some of your seeds have these F1, 2, 3, 4, 5s or 9s, whatever, and how come some of them don't have any of those, that nomenclature? And I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Uh I mean, I can speak to my strains specifically, but typically if it doesn't have an indication, then it's an F1, um, which just means it's a cross. Well, know. I can add I can add that to funny names and free seeds. Okay. Right, <laughs> right exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a pejorative though. It's just sometimes it saves space on the, on the labeling, you know? Yeah, G generally speaking, though, what we've found is ones that are not clearly labeled are not only on the label, but on the <laughs> website or anywhere also tend to be the ones we have the most issues with that they're all over the road. And it's probably because they're just F1. Someone took this plant, crossed it with that one, said, oh, look, now I have super, you know, bubblegum haze. You know, yeah, we, we, we also have the guys buying these kits. You can buy these kits online, right? They're bottles of colloidal silver or whatever. You spray the male plant, turns it into a female plant, blah, blah, blah. They make female seeds. They call it whatever they want. They sell these seeds. And we try and keep the customers way away from that, you know? Right. Uh, so we've been, we've been trying to point people towards these strains that are clearly labeled and, and more stable genetics. Um, let's, let's whip through, because um, I don't want to, you know, run, run short on time. We want to talk about soil and, and amendments and other things as well. Uh, but let's whip through real quick. What can you tell us about, like we put four strains up and we picked them for specific reasons. Um, and um, so we've got uh, tricks. Oh yeah, go for it. Tricks, biscotto, vitamins, and whiskey Zulu. And what we did okay. was, we, you know, we talked about curating. We curated um, um, a collection over at the autoflowerstore.com. Um, and uh, what we're looking for is things that will grow um, in a confined space, 
uh, that you're not trying to, you know, go in a in, in an armoire or in a tent, you know, in a two by two by you know four tent or something, um, and and trying to grow a 15 foot tall, you know, sativa uh, photo period or something. Um, so we look for things that are that that are um, sized appropriately, um, and um, uh, and that that we think are stable and will give the uh, the best grow results to to the customer. Um, so um, so we pick these strains. Um, Tell, what can you tell us about uh, tricks? Um, vitamins and whiskey Zulu, those particular four. So let's start with tricks. Tricks is basically, and I, I know everything's inverted, so you can't see it. Um, but nope, we tricks, got it. We see it. <laughs> tricks is effectively that triangle Kush auto. If it never got crossed, well, when it never got crossed to watermelon skittles. So we were able to, and so this is another back, going back to your filial generation question. This is another advantage to keeping seeds from a prior harvest. So I can, I can continue that, that, that triangle Kush OG auto flower line that we made. I can continue that as many uh, generations as I want to. Now it's going to be, occasionally you'll get one that's a little bit citrusy er but it's, it's very subtle on the citrus. It's, it's mostly like an OG gas with just an occasional subtle citrus to it. Um, there's very little variability. So I like to recommend it for commercial as well as home growers. Um, all, like even out of 700 plants, only a couple of them fade to purple. Most of them stay green. Um, we've topped some, we've not topped others. We've trained some, we've not trained them. You know, so, so it's, it's a good one for just like, it's a people pleaser. You're going to like it. And it gets pretty frosty. Uh, the Moscato. Pretty, pretty consistent. Yep. Yeah. The Moscato. Yep. Yeah. I would, I would say tricks consistency. If, 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 is, if that's what you're going for, uh, tricks is definitely a good place to start. Now you brought up Moscato, which I know after testing is by far our most uniform strain, which again is an eyebrow raiser for that filial generation question, because it's only an F4. But we've tested it and we've had other people test it and they all flower at the same time. They all grow to the same height. The only thing that's not perfectly consistent is the look. Some of them fade a little bit more purple. Some of them fade a little bit more gray. But for the most part, they all have a very gassy profile with just occasionally a little bit of like a black licorice. So it's nice. It's gassy, unique, but gassy. Um, and then again, easy to grow. And the one thing that's cool about this is, again, it's an F4 but the nug structure on it is very familiar to photo period growers. Like you're going to be growing it and you're going to be like, this is a little bit more of a dense nug than I've seen on other autos and stuff like that. It's, it's familiar to photo period growers. And that's what I really like about it because you get a lot of criticisms from the auto flower world of uh, the texture of your weed or the high of your weed or the smell of your weed. And when it comes to Biscotto, I really think we hit it out of the park. I think we checked a lot of boxes I think people who grow this weed are going to look at it and be really happy with it. All right. Um, Talk about vitamins. That one's uh, unique because it's a one-to-one, -one, right? Yeah. So the, the vitamins is interesting. I'm really happy that you got behind it um, because people see the CBD and they get scared by it. So I wouldn't. Uh, unique cannabinoid uh, profiles, like all it means is just a different type of high. It doesn't mean you're not going to get high. And the, C and the THC influence in that particular strain is pretty high. So it, while you can get one that's a little bit more three to one CBD to THC, the odds of that happening are pretty low. Um, and if you're planting a lot of them, you can get the average of your harvest down to uh, a one to one. So if you were to plant like maybe 20 or more of them and bring it down, you could get that average potency down to about one to one. But yeah, dude, the one thing that is really uniform about that, that strain is the terp is really good. It's um, grapefruit-ish and then fruit bowl. So it's very fruity um, and it's a looker. Bag appeal, it's a looker in the garden. It fades, very pretty. All right. How about tell, tell, talk about Whiskey Zulu and then we're going to move on to soils. Yeah, Whiskey Zulu is a crowd pleaser for sure. That one comes from Watermelon Skittles. Uh, now, our version of this does have the 
Trizzler influence in it. So the Trizzler, again, is that triangle Kush watermelon Skittles auto. And the Whiskey Zulu was us trying to keep the watermelon Skittles uh, flavor profile in with the Ruderalis, so to keep it moving forward. Um, and it, it just so happened that the Trizzler parent that we breeded with did a really good job. So when we, when we back crossed or in crossed, however you'd like to think of that, uh, when we back crossed, cause we do experiments, we keep a couple of extra plants near some donors whenever we can. It's, it's very particular the way that we choose to do these things, but it, it so happened that the watermelon Skittles, uh, receiver and the Trizzler donor paired very well together. Um, and it really enhanced that red fruit, fumy candy. So if you get any gas on the nose, it's, it's much more of a fumy gas. It's a very candy, floral, uh, red candy, fumy. Uh, it's, it's a people pleaser for sure. For all the people who right. like Skittles in terms of photo period, you're going to really like Whiskey Zulu. All right. All right. Well, I've been uh, uh, a fan of your, you guys, what you're doing over there, your genetics. Uh, you really do know your stuff. Um, and then in the auto world, you know, you guys are doing a great job. And, um, yeah, we're excited to, I'm excited to grow these out. It's going to take me a little while. I'm growing them all out one by one, uh, growing them all myself. And, yeah, send uh, us pictures. Thanks for the support. But yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. So, well, thank you very much. Very cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, soils, soil and then uh, soils uh, and soil amendments. Um, so when we're, when we're growing um, and we're working with our customers, um, I know there's a bit, very popular trend towards the super soils um, and the, uh, for, especially for all the beginners. Um, and it's what we recommend is work off a of super soil um, all the nutrients in the bag, you know, and uh, just add water sort of approach. Um, so we don't get into um, a lot of crazy um, uh, new adding and things like that. Um, we work with things like we usually recommend products like out west, um, uh, EB Stone recipe 420. Vincent's been growing that forever, loves it. Um, where I am, he's in California, where I am out on the East Coast, we can't get it here. Um, and then, uh, so we have a list, Michigan made mix, uh, we've got the EB stone recipe 420, ocean forest, uh, Vince, I don't know if you want to throw in a couple comments on that and then we'll jump into, uh, with Tommy on, uh, well, I'll segue to that. What we found was, um, all of these commercial mixes seem to be a little hot for autoflowers, um, getting, getting them to sprout and into nice seedlings and then to baby plants. A lot of people struggled with it. And we tried a few different things. We tried a small little um, inlet of um, light warrior. We, we use azos, mycos. But eventually when fish ship appeared, I started experimenting with it right away. And it became, within six months, it became the de facto we don't need to do any of those other things. The fish shit, literally from germination onward, um, is just a game changer. That's all I can say. And um, I, to be honest, I mean, I when customers have a really nice plant that's responding really well, sometimes I'll have them double or even triple the dose and see what happens. And and sometimes <laughs> I regret it because they outgrow the box, Tommy. <laughs> we're basically soil and fish shit and at the end to address the the airiness Aaron um we use a pk booster and it sounds like maybe um on 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 your um uh on, a, on at least your biscotto maybe it's pretty dense right maybe we don't need a pk booster Because we find it, it, when you have a confined space, <clears throat> heat is an issue, right? And and we have a very special light, and and basically the light is made for us. And there's no, there's no buttons on it; there are knobs on it, so you can control the radiation with one knob, and the other knob controls twelve spectrum. And it really, it really allows you to tune it into the plant if the plant likes the radiation turn it up doesn't like it 
turn it down, you know? Um, so we, we, we've really, we went, I don't know, this is our fourth generation light, I think, Eric? Uh, yes, correct, yep. And it's the best light we've had so far, and, and we worked with them for a year on it. It was originally a 270 watt light, and it's 160 watts now, and our people are running them at about between 70% each knob and 85% each knob. And they, they must keep their house cool. There's a four or five degree differential. If your house is 73, your box is going to be 75. And we tell people, you know, don't buy an armoire if you live in an unair conditioned place or at least just grow in the winter. Don't grow in the summer. Because, um, you know, at 95 degrees, <laughs> they don't like it. I don't care what they are. They don't yeah, like they're Alice jeans. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the questions I had for Tom, actually, is uh, so if you're saying that heat is a factor, I know that the that like the microbes can, that microbial life can be an issue, but at the same time, it could be optimal for certain growth. Like I, I know we do really, really well with our auto flowers around 80 degrees, 82 degrees, but I know that, that makes some indoor growers nervous. And I see explosive growth in that range. So maybe... May, Maybe there's something happening in the soil. Maybe those microbes are helping to maintain something in the root in the in the bed. There. What are your yeah, thoughts? I on? can speak to that a little bit. So, um, because we have such a, a diverse microbial profile, right? The plant is going to call whatever group um, of bacteria that it needs in at that time. So, look, it can help with things like fixing on breaking down nitrogen, pho mobilizing phosphorus. And then obviously there's gonna be different bacteria that can aid with different, um, you know, different functions of that plant. Um, so, so yeah, a, a robust microbial uh, profile in that root zone is gonna one, make a plant healthy. If the plant's healthy, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be better equipped to deal with environmental factors, right? Drought, drought stress, overwatering, um, you know, underwatering, overwatering, heat stress. Uh, it'll help to photosynthesize a little bit better if we've got lack of light or, you know, uh, so yeah, a, you know, a healthy rhizosphere is the key to a healthy plant overall. You know, just like a healthy gut biome, you know, you get healthier humans if you have a healthier bacterial profile in your stomach. The same can be said for plants. Well, well you mentioned some bio. things that compound on each other too. Uh, so going back to that heat issue, if you have a heat issue and an overwater issue, it's going to look four times as bad as it really is. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're sitting there only addressing the heat of your system, but you're not learning that, like, for example, the moisture that your pot wants to be at. And I, I do mean like the dirt, um, you know, or if you're only addressing how much you're watering and not the temperature of the room, you know, you could be compounding your errors just simply by mistake. Right, right. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's all about temperature, water, and light, truly. Right. Inside the armoire, I mean, you talk about the rhizosphere right underneath, right? Well, the armoire is a bio chamber, and you right. tune it, you literally tune it with the light and the watering and, 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 and essentially the temperature. And you have to equalize those out. And once you get those equalized out, whether it's at 80 degrees or 78 or whatever the plant wants, you're off to the races, you know. I think we can add one more thing to that that a lot of people overlook, and that's pH. Because without having your, your pH right in that root zone, it doesn't make a difference what you're doing. People used to come into my hydro shop uh, back in the late 2000s and say, I need nitrogen. I'm like, no, you need a pH meter. Without saying anything, like, have you checked your pH today, right? Right, uh, right. That, that, that is the, the, the only thing we deal with. You know, it's kind of like- we try variable make, you can't control, right? <laughs> we're trying to make it very simple, but when we have them test their pH, when we've run out of, you know, diag diagnostics, right? We have them test their pH. A guy says, oh, I get my RH water from Vons or whatever. Test the pH of 8.5. It's like, whoa, okay. So, so yeah, pH is a factor. We don't have too much of a factor because a lot of the, a lot of the water, the distilled water is like 5.9, and then the soils are 6.3, 4, 5. So we don't have a lot of issues, and we're only 70 days in the box. But when it comes down to the last thing left, it's always pH. 
why don't we back up for a second? Tommy, why don't you uh, tell me, tell me about fish shit. Tell me about fish Ed farms, the company, how you right. started and what you're doing. And let's talk about fish shit and what it really is. Cause people are confused. A lot of people think it's nutrients, it's food. All right. So, so we'll start out. It's fish shit. I normally give everybody one guess to tell me what's in the bottom, but it says it right on the front. Uh, fish Ed farms is a, a group of about four partners. We started, we all come from, from different backgrounds. I've been I've been cultivating cannabis, um, you know, behind the scenes since 2007. Um, one of the original patients in Rhode Island when we went over to uh, to uh, medicinal here, and and I jumped right on. I was building rooms um, for people and got really chummy with a lot of the um, hydroponic hydroponic shop owners in Rhode Island, Southern New England, uh, all over Maine and in in, in uh, Mass and. Um, uh, when I got my license, I got it for a buddy of mine in muscular dystrophy. He passed away in uh, 2014. At that point, I had about seven years of indoor growing experience amongst, you know, a number of years of outdoor growing before we were allowed to. And uh, his biology high, his biology teacher in, um, went for high school in chemistry approached me and said, look, I know you've been at cannabis, you know, um, uh, and uh, I've got this little project I want you to take a look at. So my buddy passed away in 14. I went to see him uh, in late 14, and uh, he had uh, um, actually uh, late 14. He, he said, "Look, I got this thing I want. I want to show you." So uh, he started. He had some plants growing that were this big, and some plants going this big. And I knew they were all the same phenol. And it, 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 believe it or not, it was actually like green crack right back then, and that was the cool strain to grow. And uh, and I said. Dave, what gives here? And he said, well, I give this one, I think it was usually Jack's one, two, three. And this one, you know, Jack's and what was the earliest variation of fish shit was just pretty much tank water, you know, in, in its rawest form, right? Um, and I said, wow, that's, you got a product here in like the biggest cliche fashion. He whipped out like an F-style jug with a handwritten logo on it and said, I call it fish if you want it. I said, yep. He said to me, will you go home and test any grows? I said, nope, <laughs> absolutely not. So, I actually put up a, uh, a little, I put up a 12 light room to start testing it. I tested it all through 15, brought it to market in 16, um, quickly realized that my first show in Novi that uh, there was no way I could ship around application 50 to 100 mLs per gallon, right? So I'm back in the drawing board, we reformulated, learned how to concentrate it while taking out all of the MPK and just delivering you that, uh, the bacterial profile that's in that bottle now. Um, and uh, we brought the, the, the formula as it is today to market in 17 minus exploding bottles because we didn't have vented caps. We went back to the drawing board, went through about six variations of the caps because uh, we were creating little shit missiles during the summer in transit. We had shit exploding <laughs> all over the country the summer of 17. Um, I and then, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 So, uh, so we went back to that. We got shelf stable and uh, we were able to, uh, to take, uh, take the product uh, pretty much across the globe and all pretty much all relevant cannabis markets around around in this country. Um, all 50 states um, we're licensed in. We sell in about 13 or 14 different countries and we're knocking on the door of the other legal markets. It's just a matter of, you know, time and getting a bacteria from country to country. What fish it is, is the most robust beneficial bacteria on the market. There's about 4,600 unique species of different um, um, uh, bacteria and then uh, mycorrhizae in there. So we've got bacteria and mycorrhizae, and we all know that that combination is fantastic. We're we're, we're created in a, in a uh, in an aquatic environment. Well, 100% uh, organic. We are CDFA, CFIA, OMRI. We're working on the Oregon Tith, and then I forgot what uh, Washington is. We've got the, the top two big ones, and the others will fall. Uh, we can be used with all nutrient systems, synthetic or organic. So that's why we work tremendously with you guys. Um, so the bacteria doesn't differentiate whether, you know, it's munching on, you know, the rawest form of nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, or some super salt that you're getting out of a bag and mixing yourself, right? It just doesn't care. It breaks it down and makes it more bioavailable. That said, it also works in conjunction or in all grow medium, synthetic or organic. You can grow it on, you know, you can grow in grow stones, you can grow in super soil, you can grow in cocoa, peat, or a combination of any of those. Again, it doesn't, doesn't really care where it lives, right? Um, it is a family owned and operated farm. My partners and I, it's us and uh, their kids and a few other friends and family. We've taken this thing pretty far with the crew we have 
Uh, there are no, that said, there are no hormones used for breeding. There are no uh, antivirals. There are obviously no antibacterial agents introduced. There are no fish harmed in the making of this product. It's a big misconception that we have to overcome is that fish shit is, an, is, is a, a cold press or an emulsion or an MPK sauce. It is not. There is no fish in the product. It is just fish shit. And in that fish shit is the most cutting edge, robust, beneficial bacteria um, in the cannabis world right now. And uh, we're starting to make some pretty big waves in row crops and specialty crops as well. So stay tuned for that. We get some, we're at the tail end of a, a, a three year study and it's pretty impressive what we have going on in that space. Let right. me ask can you, add, can I ask, ask a question? question? Go oh, for it, one at a time, one at a time. <laughs> do you add do you add sugars for food to your product or do you recommend or what sugars do you recommend we would use uh, you know what listen I'm, we're, we're big microbes. fans of molasses we buy molasses by the pallet like literally pallets of molasses it's part of the brew process it helps us get to the desired rich rating or the you know the the bacterial content uh before we start calling out all of the mpk and it allows a little bit of residual food in there to you know to keep the guys going and, re and reinvigorate them so um, yeah, so molasses is part of the process. And is also, I recommend, you know, when, you know, if you're planting some sort of carbohydrate. So my question is, I sometimes solve some late stage nitrogen issues by adding more fish shit. Like yep. I see an hydrogen problem, like when you got a 70 day grow and 80 day grow and you see some nitrogen problems at, you know, around 70 days. Instead yeah. of adding nitrogen, I will add more fish shit. So there's I can definitely speak to that. So what I, I think what you're seeing there, and this is this speaks to why we work tremendously with like a succulent which doesn't like a lot of nitrogen, or some of these like anthurium and silage and stuff like that that are very susceptible to newts. We don't have any available NPK. But by upping your dose at the end, what's going to happen is you have unavailable NPK that's locked up in the bodies of that, the bacteria. So as that bacteria die you're introducing trace amounts of NPK by virtue of them breaking down and you release. It's not a real food source, but to help, you know, at the end of that 70 days to introduce some of those, you know, late stage deficiencies you might see, it definitely could provide a boost, but it's not immediately available. There has to be that war of bacteria. Some, you know, some die off and then they become available. They are broken down by other. It's just a lot more benign than adding a yeah. blue, a blue blue chemical, you know. Agreed. Well, and I, I can second that on Tom's end. So coming from the grower's side, I can say I, I I I know his advice works because in practice I've done what you've done, Vincent, which is apply the microbial product when you see what you think to be the nutrition problem issue. Right. Right. And, and, and it's, it's helpful to free up the nutrition that is in the soil, and it's useful to know your soil, too. I know you have a few more questions prepared on this, Eric, but just like, for example, I know there's a lot of soils. We, we've had an issue with, like, you know, sometimes your cocoa isn't all the way, like, broken down, so you might have potassium issues if you're rocking a high cocoa soil, something like that. So rather than just jumping straight to the juice, starting with a microbe to address your, your issue and then mm -hmm. tweaking it from there it can be quite beneficial. Yeah, there's probably a lot of locked up available nutrient in the system that the plant can't access anyway, right? So by introducing the can opener, the plant tells the microbe what it wants, the microbe breaks it down and gives it. The plant always knows what it wants, right? And a lot of times it's present, just not available. So by having, you know, the Swiss army knife of uh, beneficial bacteria out there, you're gonna provide the plant a pathway to get what it needs, not give it what it needs, right? So. Right, right, absolutely. And the other question is uh, for the audience is um, let's talk about you, know, you talked about the microhazy. Um, let's talk about you know the uh, the immune system of the plant and how fish shit will help with that. Yeah. So look, just by virtue of being a happier, healthier plant, you're going to be a little bit more pest resistant. You're going to be drought resistant. Um, you're going to help encourage a, a much more robust root zone in the beginning. And you know by having a, a, a you know a robust root zone, you're going to have vigorous vegetative growth, lush plants, healthy plants, which is gonna to help to continue, right? So you start with a, a really uh, a really killer root zone and that's gonna really, that's gonna help, you know, you overcome different issues, whether they're environmental factors or, you know, pest factors, you become a little bit more resistant to those just by virtue of being very healthy and strong, right? Right, absolutely, absolutely. All right, um, I wanna mention, if anyone has questions, I know some, some folks have just jumped in. Uh, we also, you can post them in the chat or you can just speak up, but uh, you know, feel free uh, 
Uh, and on our uh, previous webinar, we didn't leave enough room for uh, Q&A at the end and people had questions. So I wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to jump in with any questions you might have. Um, talking about the uh, soils, genetics, uh, that sort of thing. Um, Vincent, you wanna talk a little bit about the environment? We've got maybe about five minutes here. Uh, we, we had booked this from six to seven, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, do you, uh, you wanna talk a little bit about uh, environmental issues? Well, it's just very difficult to, to grow plants in confined spaces in general. And the armoire is a one plant system. Um, we've always envisioned a double armoire, a two plant system, if you will, uh, separate chambers actually. So you could grow two different strains. Um, but the whole point of the environment really is to tune it to the strain and to basically, like I said, it, it, it's, it's about temperature, it's about water and, and including the pH part of the water, of course. Um, and it's about light. And for a long time, uh, we had a lot of trouble with light. We had a lot of radiation burn, which we don't have anymore. Um, that's Eric's plant. Um, what are you growing there? Is that LSD, Eric? It's LSD auto, yeah. And it's just, uh, it's just flowering now. What are you running your light at? Uh, it's at, now it's at 80 on both. 80% on each. Okay, so so yeah, that, that, that's, and, and what's your temperature in there? And I just, and I just knocked it up. I, I, I was running a little bit lower before. I knocked it up me about two days ago and it's running at, at the, it's right behind the light. Right now it's about 79. Okay, perfect. So yeah, the environment is, is, is key and, and you know, you got to get off to a good start with your sprout. And then once you get to a baby plant, then you start getting, you know, respiration in, and you start getting the, the, the combination of photosynthesis and the respiration basically bring the temperature down. The bigger the plant, the easier to control the temperature because the plant's using more of the radiation, more of the light in general. Um, I was in the aquarium trade for a long time um, as, a, as a consumer, coral reef aquariums. And, and I don't know if you know, but today, if you buy a coral reef aquarium, you can control every single spectrum on a slider, every spectrum. So if you wanna grow acapora corals, which are kind of staghorns and stuff, they want a lot more light. They grow closer to the surface and so, the light over on that side of the tank, you want to goose certain, certain spectrums. And then the, the soft corals on the other side of the tank, they like a little more they're to hide a little bit. They don't like that intense light. So you tune in the light on that side. And these are, these are LEDs above the aquariums. You've probably seen them. But they all have literally either from a smartphone or from a little device where you can literally use a slider for every single spectrum. It's pretty cool. I've thought about trying to apply it to this, but too much information is too much information, <laughs> yeah, especially for simple. beginner growers, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah, what we're doing with the armoire, it's, it's trying to keep the whole thing simple. It's our mm -hmm. own protocol. It's a little unique from, uh, you know, what people are probably used to in either outdoor grows or even indoor grows, but photo period. And, you know, we've kind of got our own little way of doing things. And going to knobs instead of switches has been a huge, um, uh, I mean, it was a big, a little bit of a learning curve, but it was, it makes a huge difference to be able to, to, to tune, tune in the uh, frequencies, the, 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 the radiation and all the other lights and, you know, we use a little bit of everything, you know, UV, UVB, everything you can think of. Right, right. All right. I see Heather just came in. So what do you think, Heather? No, I'm just kidding. Throwing you under the bus. <laughs> Throwing you under the bus. Um, all right. Um, any uh, any questions or any uh, more thoughts, parting thoughts or words here? Pretty straightforward. All right. All right. Well, I thank everybody for coming. It's seven o'clock on the dot. Um, we are going to, like, this has been recording. So um, if you came in late or if you missed any of it, um, we are going to post this up on our YouTube channel. And um, everyone will be able to go back and, uh, and uh, give it a view. Um, thank you all for coming. I want to thank Tommy uh, from Fish Ship Ed Farms for coming and Aaron from 2020 Mendocino. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thanks for the support.
Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we highly recommend you guys products, both of you, um, you know, we believe in them. So we're, we're really happy you were able to join us today. <laughs>